Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. I'm Philip Eidson, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement, advisor to procurement leaders around the world, and the founder and managing director of Art of Procurement. My team and I work with our global network of subject matter experts to help companies elevate procurement impact whether that's through building and implementing transformation programs, sustainably reducing external expenses, or leveraging AOP Mastermind, our learning and development platform for companies of all sizes. You're listening to our flagship podcast, where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their results with the needs of the business. Hi everybody, welcome to today's Art of Procurement podcast and with this being the first episode of the month, I'm joined as always by Kelly Barner, owner and managing director of Buyers Meeting Point and general manager here at Art of Procurement. Kelly, thanks for joining me again and how's it going? It's going well and as a matter of fact, I hear congratulations in order. Does does this particular week mark maybe a special date for Art of Procurement? Yeah, it's crazy. So five years of Art of Procurement, the beginning of November 2015. Um, Yeah, and here we are. I think 340 odd episodes in and um, it's been quite a journey. But yeah, five years this week. That's amazing. So now 2020 is not the best year to be asking this question, but let's just assume that things were normal. Mm -hmm. As you look back over the last five years, what was the piece about the journey that surprised you the most? Um, Honestly, um, I was probably surprised. Like when I started, I had no idea, um, you know, is this going to be something that's fleeting or is Mm. this going to be something that that, that really engages with the community? And you know, I was really pleasantly surprised that, that what we were doing resonated. And, you know, that obviously gave the motivation to continue. I think um, what surprised me is uh, the power of community. Oh, you know, yeah. we've really built, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who are listening today. There's a lot of folks who have really engaged in a lot of things we've done over the last few years. And I think um, for the most part, um, really everybody in the community wants the entire community to succeed. And we're all here for each other. Um you know, probably I wasn't prepared for some of the um, behind the scenes, you know, um, the the stuff in the community that uh, isn't necessarily like that, doesn't mm-hmm. think like that. And unfortunately, you know, there are corners that um, don't necessarily have that perspective. And I think I was naive to that. Um, it's probably a so, good thing, actually. If you hadn't yeah. been naive to it, it might have discouraged you from starting the journey. Absolutely. And it just motivates you even more to really do the best that you can and to help people every single day. And, uh, you know, I, I firmly believe if you do that, then good things follow. Yeah. Now, and this is funny because I, at times like this, I tend to stop at these milestones too, and, and kind of reflect back on the journey. And one of the images that always comes into my mind, um, is from a book called the dip. I'm sure a Mm -hmm. lot of people have, have read it and I sort of keep in my mind, this is probably violating every rule of podcasting because I'm going to describe (laughs) a visual, but you know, sort of the line, like you have this little time where it goes down. And then if you have done things right, and if you have understood the value proposition, the line eventually does course correct and, and go back up. Um, I'm I'm sure because I've been there for many of them. There have in fact been some dips, but there's also yeah. been an awful lot of surge opportunities and and growth times. Um, any thoughts about what is yet to come and how steep our current trajectory is? Yeah, I'm really really excited. You know where we are. Uh, you're right. It's one of the things that I would always hear from people was that um, you know entrepreneurship and and going out and doing your own thing is a roller coaster. Yeah. And you would look at that and think, you know what, that sounds a little bit cliche. I'm I'm not a big believer in cliches. Um, well, that's exactly how it's been <laughs> um, for the last five years. But I, there's never been a point of time in the last five years that I've been more excited and confident about the future. Um, you know, we just came off a uh, Mastermind Live event. Uh, we're building a vibrant community within Mastermind itself, within our, our uh, membership community. Um, there's a lot of good things that are happening from other parts of the business as well. So um, I'm just in a really, I, I think that 
I'm excited to see what 2021 brings um, and then how we can continue to use that to reinvest back in ultimately community. Because as a young business, that's always the number one thing is how can you get access to the resources to be able to invest back into doing the things you want to do? Uh, and I, I finally see a path to be able to do that. So that's really exciting for me. I absolutely agree. Well, I'm glad to be able to be among the first to offer congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I as well cannot wait to find out what is obviously going to come up. I know we have some exciting things happening in November, so how we're going to finish out 2020. Um, but I know already that we have big plans for 2021 as well. Yeah. And for, for the rest of November here, what we're going to do is we're going to share a special Q&A series where every day um, the two of us, we're going to take a question a day and we're going to answer some of the most common questions we got over the last five years. Just really a short five minute pod um, and share those with our community. So that's going to be um, every day. I think it's going to be from as you're listening to this, uh, this the following Monday, we're going to run that for three weeks. Um, and just really interested to get that out there. Um, now, let's come back to today's podcast and today's uh, conversation. Uh, we both spoke with Mike Crowsdale, and Mike is the Director of GPO Operations at CarCentric, and he has particular domain expertise in the MRO category. Now, CarCentric, they're a leading provider of procurement solutions that uh, transform how companies purchase, pay, and get paid. They're also members of our experts on demand. We talked a little bit about consulting before. They're members of our experts on demand ecosystem, and they are sponsors of this uh, podcast series, which we do once a month. So in today's conversation, we both discussed with Mike the current state of the MRO category. We looked at some of the different models that can be used to manage MRO, the state of PPE here as we're entering the winter here in the Northern Hemisphere, and then tips for getting MRO stakeholders engaged in collaborating with procurement. So with all that being said, Kelly, thank you for joining me uh, in this little uh, intro. We're going to go straight into the conversation where my first question to Mike was, did you find procurement or did procurement find you? Honestly, it's a little bit of both. Um, and I'm going to take you back a little bit to back when I was in high school. Um, I guess I was always a little bit business minded or business focused. Mm -hmm. And I saw an opportunity to purchase pallets of uh, electronic items that were returns. Okay. Um, from, so like, say like a Best Buy or yeah. a C circuit city, um, and purchasing the pallets of electronics and then reselling them piece by piece on eBay. Um, and then from there, taking it a bit further, uh, I recognize that when you come out of high school and go to college or university that, um, people typically are purchasing a, a laptop computer and most of the colleges were offering a pre-packaged laptop that was absurdly expensive for what mm -hmm. you were buying. So I tried to infiltrate that market and sell laptops to students coming out of high school and actually started a company called Laptops First. It never really got off the ground, but now that I'm in the procurement industry, I recognized that all of those things that I was doing were very procurement and sourcing focused. Right. <laughs> and then coming out of college uh, with a finance degree, I had basically decided that I wanted to either work on Wall Street or go into consulting. So I did the typical thing and blasted out a whole bunch of resumes all over the place um, and ended up getting a hit at a company called Source One. Mm -hmm. um, went through an interview there and got a call back within a couple of weeks um, that they had accepted me for the position. Um, so started in consulting um, as an analyst and kind of rose up the ranks. And now I'm a, a procurement guy. <laughs> and focusing a lot on MRO, which yes. is really the topic of today's conversation. And um, I, I am interested in why MRO, but I want to start actually by asking, you know, how do you define MRO? Because MRO is one of those categories, I think, that can mean different things to different people. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a very broad definition. Um, I would say that the typical categorization for the acronym is maintenance, repair, and operations. Yeah. Um, I pretty much lump that as everything that falls under 
your indirect spend um, that goes into keeping a business running. So not only the nuts and bolts that a uh, company's purchasing, let's say to keep um, uh, a line running, but yeah. also the services that go along with it. Um, so all of those things fall underneath that um, MRO umbrella. What would be some example? Because it's an interesting kind of point you make about it's not necessarily just products, but also services. Because I think a lot of times you, you do think about MRO as being physical products. So what would be some examples of accompanying services that would fall under that umbrella? Yeah, so there's uh, the engineering services, um, not just actually the engineers themselves to come in and um, fix things if they're broken, uh, help with design. Um, but also there's some product engineering as well. Um, obviously facility maintenance, uh, in terms of keeping your operations clean, uh, in order to be effectively running. Um, but there's, there's also a lot of, uh, service element, um, that goes along with it. So when you, let's say you purchase a fastener, yeah. um, you might just be buying a generic fastener, whereas. Uh, there could be an accompanying service where somebody from that supplier side comes in and is basically like, hey, I, I saw that you purchased XYZ fastener. Did you know if you purchased this other fastener, even though it's 25% um, more expensive, uh, it's going to last you essentially five years longer than the other one. Mm -hmm. So when it comes down to a total cost of ownership perspective, there's things like that that organizations should be taking advantage of from their suppliers. Uh, because it's paramount in reducing your total cost of ownership versus just looking at piece price. Now, I'm maybe getting ahead of myself, but it's an interesting, you know, I kind of want to follow up on that with, um, do you see more and more, I think the word is like servitization of, um, of products, you know, where people are actually selling services that used to be product because they're selling an outcome. Has anything like that really come to the MRO world yet? Or is it still, you know, traditional, I'm going to purchase, um, um, you know, more of the traditional, like we said before, there is some product, there is some services, but perhaps those have been separate from each other. Honestly, I think that there's been a variety of swings within the MRO industry. Right. So the MRO industry was first founded on being very service oriented. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the sales guys in there all the time with working on not only upselling, but helping refine your operations, cleaning up your inventory things of that nature and working hand in hand with you. Um, then with uh, the more and more online buying, uh, things shifted into people just trying to grab an item at the lowest price and ignoring all of those service things. But now things are kind of coming back around to, hey, I understand that this item is a lower cost, but it might make sense if I call the supplier and try to figure out if this is actually the best item for me right. to purchase for this particular thing. Yeah. So you're getting them a lot more involved in instead of just sending them a specification or a drawing or something like that, you're actually working with them to figure out the best solution. Yeah. They're the experts. So yeah. I always find, uh, especially with my consulting background, it's always best to take advantage of an expert. Now, this is a category that I think a lot of uh, organizations uh, believe that they have under control when we talk about spend under management, um, or they've perhaps, you know, gone through various different iterations of strategies, uh, which oftentimes may just be kind of price focused. But there's a general feeling that MRO, it's a category that we've looked after, that we've had some specific expertise looking at for a while now. Um, you know, that being the case, well, one, first of all, I want to know, is that what you generally see? before I ask a follow-up, that it's a category that has been touched in at least in some way, shape, or yeah, form. Yeah, I would say in some way, shape, or form, in most, in I would say in almost all mature organizations, as well as most semi-mature up-and-coming organizations, mm -hmm. it has been quote-unquote touched or they think that they have it under control. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, they'll, they'll get some quick contracts in place um, and call it a day and be like, yeah, we're trying to drive purchasing to this supplier. Um, we have uh, some category level discounts. We, ha we have it under control. The spend under is under management since we have a contract that's 
within MRO, but there's so many things within MRO that having a few contracts in place doesn't right. mean that you technically have it managed. So when you come to an organization that has that kind of context uh, and background, what are some of the sourcing strategies that you see that are actually the most effective? And and I hesitate to say in just in saving money because I don't think that that's the um, that's necessarily the number one driver of of ROI for every single organization. But you know, where do you make a difference? Where do you see the biggest difference when you come into a company that has that? Yeah, it's funny that you, and I do want to touch on the ROI piece first because MRO is one of the few categories that your entire operation could be shut down if you can't get a single item. Mm -hmm. So some of the most critical components to keeping operations running fall under the category. Um, So there's definitely that service side and that I need this part now. It doesn't really matter what the cost is because I'm losing hundreds of thousands of dollars by not having that line running. Yeah. Um, And then coming back to the first part, uh, the best I found that the most effective way in really getting your arms around the MRO category is through heavy data analytics. Um, so getting all that line item level data from at least a year, yeah. um, most in most cases, I would recommend two years purely because you're trying to not only spot the repeatable items, but also the repeatable categories, the repeatable manufacturers, anything that you can use to to best understand who is the end source or end category that you're most frequently spending in. That way you know where to negotiate, you know where to contract, Um, whether it is by looking at it as like, oh, I need to make sure that I have a, a supplier for power transmission bearings. Um, that's where I'm spending 60% of my money. I'm using the wrong supplier. Right. Um, or if it's, Hey, I noticed that I'm using this manufacturer all the time. We're not always buying the same component and it's hard to predict which component we're buying, but I know I'm using this manufacturer. It probably makes sense to go talk to that manufacturer versus going through a distributor. So from my perspective, everything revolves around understanding the data to a pretty granular level. What kind of data sources do you look for? Because I think that's something we often struggle in is where do we pull that from? You know, maybe it's it's hiding in some spend analytics tool. Maybe it's some in, in some invoicing tools. Where do you typically go to try and start at least to build the picture of, yeah. uh, of what that looks like? Depending on how good your internal systems are, uh, whether it's your ERP or if you have some type of prepare to pay technology in place is going to depend on it's going to be highly dependent on the level of data that you have available and easy, like easy access at your fingertips. Yeah. Um, most of the time, unfortunately, what gets entered in is, isn't always very usable or clean. I find the most effective way to get the data that you need in the right format is actually to reach out to your supply base and, uh, request that level of usage. So when you think about um, sourcing strategies and supplier selection strategies, you know, you, you see there's a, a, a couple of ways you can go. One is you see these huge organizations who, you know, claim to cover the entire gamut of MRO spend. So you're going with a big generalist or you have mm-hmm. obviously specialists uh, who are, um, are very good at one thing and they focus on one thing only. Um, as you start to look at that mix, I mean, what goes into that? Do you have any preference of one or the other, or what are some of the considerations that a sourcing lead should take into account when they're looking at their kind of supplier mix and the profile of their suppliers? Yeah, I think you need to have a combination. So you should always make sure to have a catch-all supplier. Um, There's going to be odds and ends that you need to purchase where the most effective way to get them is through that catch-all type of supplier. Mm -hmm. Plus they do just because of the size and scale generally come in during a pinch. Um, but you, you do need to make sure that you're layering in those specialists based on your spending patterns. Um, you're not going to get the best price from a generalist. Right. They just have, are holding way too much inventory to be ever able to do that for you. Whereas the specialist, they have relationships with key manufacturers or are a manufacturer themselves. Um, and you'll be able to drive deeper discounts through them 
and it makes sense to usually contract with them as well based on um, which categories you're spent underneath the MRO umbrella you're spending yeah. within. Now, how about, uh, I, I'm not sure if they're the 800 pound gorilla in the room yet, but I think they probably certainly have desires to be, you know, what about somebody like Amazon business? Um, are they changing the marketplace for MRO? Is it a place that they've not really got into yet? Um, how do you see that impacting the supply market for MRO? Yeah. So they have definitely penetrated the office supply space yeah. and they've done that pretty effectively. So People are starting to move away from the staples, the Office Depot slash Office Max, um, and taking advantage of of uh, Amazon Business. Um, a lot of it is it, people are shopping uh, and looking at and comparing both sources and mm -hmm. literally just trying to find the lowest price. I personally don't recommend doing that because of the time suck yeah. uh, invested in shopping around every single item, unless it's a higher dollar item. Um, in the MRO world, they are trying to definitely carve out a, a footprint for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that they've been able to penetrate the market, that's questionable, but it's, it is certainly an area of focus for them. Uh, and as the next generation of sourcing and procurement managers starts coming into the fold people are really used to using amazon so yeah, it's natural it's, yeah it's a, a a nice friendly environment for them to mm -hmm. to search and find an item and select based on price the it's a very clean ui um so i do i think that they're banking heavily on that in the next like 10 years or so um but personally i do think that there are some gaps now, if you think about the the Amazon business, obviously a lot of the pull for something like that, you know, you mentioned the UI being slick and familiar, that creates some pull from procurements, internal customers, right? Distributed buyers mm -hmm. of MRO. What titles or stakeholder groups do you typically encounter most directly when you're looking to bring MRO spend under management? So it's funny you mentioned that because I think... Where a lot of procurement departments err is they fail to bring all of the state MRO stakeholders to the table when making mm -hmm. decisions. So there's within any large organizations, there's probably a hundred plus people that can purchase and okay. do purchase MRO products. Uh, you're talking about the maintenance managers all the way down to, um, you know, site engineers and lower level resources. Um, if you, all those people need to have a voice in the decision-making process. Uh, when you think about it, 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 you can't just do it from a procurement silo or mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be rough controlling the spend going forward. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, I was thinking ahead a little bit as you were talking about, you know, the importance of analytics and having good data and the the problems sometimes uh, from a consistency or standardization standpoint with how the information is entered. And, you know, you kind of started to say, okay, and so for that, you need to reach out to. And I think in my mind, I auto completed the sentence with, you know, your internal buyer. And it's interesting to me that for resolving some of these data type issues, we would be better off approaching the supplier than simply going internally maybe and resolving them. Is, is that a function of how distributed the stakeholders are within MRO and how many of them there are? Or is it around the processes and sort of the point of entry um, when they're actually putting in this information that ends up being analytically problematic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a, a little bit of both with so many hands in the cookie jar, you're yeah. going to get things entered in a million different ways, especially <laughs> when things are manually entered. Um, the suppliers always, they have the cleanest source of data. It's mm -hmm. their data. Uh, if now, of course, if you have um, data fed in from the supplier via like a, a punch out system or yep. catalog in place, then your data is going to literally be the supplier's data and it's going to be in the cleanest state. 
Um, but not all organizations have that set up. They don't have procure to pay technology in place. They're not able to get punch outs in place with all their suppliers. And some suppliers honestly don't, aren't, they're, it's the MRO world. So mm. some of those suppliers don't have any of those systems in place to be able to do that. Okay. You know, I'm also interested in, uh, so many times we have these, you know, category sort of Q and A conversations. And a lot of what we end up hearing about is either historically based baggage between procurement and, you know, the specific user group within the business. Um, sometimes we hear that there's maybe a tussle for ownership. Sometimes we hear about misaligned expectations where the business assumes, oh, all you care about is the lowest price point mm -hmm. and, and procurement has to kind of reposition. Uh, how would you rate or describe uh, the current customer experience that most actual business stakeholders or distributed buyers have with procurement when it comes to MRO? You know, if we were to somehow magically bring that group of 100 people that you talked about into one room, you know, would we be, what faces would we be looking out at? Would they be angry faces? Would they be confused why they're there? Would they have a lot to say? Would they be, you know, this seems like overkill? How would you say that that either customer experience or existing business relationship is today, specifically with regard to the MRO category? Uh, you're going to get a mix. Um, there, I would say that the majority of people are familiar with the decision to bring procurement in. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's always going to be a few disgruntled people <laughs> when you're dealing with that many stakeholders. And it's largely because like you're, recommending a supplier that they had a bad experience with mm. five years ago. And like, unfortunately, sometimes you have to override that. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and then on the other side of things, there's times when procurement makes a bad decision and puts a bad policy in place mm. and tries to enforce, okay, we've picked this, we've contracted with supplier XYZ. This is the supplier that you use. That's who you should be using going forward. If I see spend somewhere else, we're going to come knocking on your door and yell at you. Um, <laughs> that always makes friends. <laughs> yeah. So that the end user, generally speaking, does know what's best without looking at price. So you have to make sure that you're listening to them. Yes. Otherwise, you're going to be shaping a bad decision. But yeah, I, when you deal with so many people, it's very hard to please every single one. I try to focus on pleasing the majority. Mm -hmm. um, if you, I would say that if you're going about it right, you're including them, um, you're walking them through the process and you're yeah. giving them that reason why, they, they, they'll buy in as long as you hear their voice and you take it into your decision-making process, mm -hmm. um, you'll have their support. And I would say that you'll have a 75% success rate by doing that. And and there are some categories where procurement would absolutely die for 75% success, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I would also kind of think that for all of sort of the nitty gritty, right, of the detail involved in MRO, it's probably one of the better opportunities that procurement gets to really understand the operation sort of from the ground level up, right? So if we think about it from... You know, we always talk about wanting to align procurement's objectives or priorities, um, and we tend to think about top-line growth. We tend to think about the CEO's perspective. I almost wonder if MRO is one of those very important exceptions where in order to advance our own understanding of how the business works and what's important to customers, and, and in some cases even where our value add is, we need to go to that level of detail where things actually happen. Uh, has that been your experience that it's a great learning opportunity for procurement? Yeah, hundred um, percent. That's where I learned uh, about procurement. That's where I was able to quickly grasp how business operations actually run. Um, and the supply chain is complex. Yes. So you get, you pretty much run the gamut. You get to understand your own operations, the company's operations, as well as the complexity 
of a supply chain and everything that goes into it because MRO, it, it's like a catch off for everything. Oh yes. So I honestly, for an early procurement professional, it, I would say it's one of the best categories. Uh, you really get thrown into the fire and there's always going to be things that come up and challenges that you're, you're going to face. It, it's a great category to, to learn from. Now, I just wanted to jump in with, uh, to kind of build on something that um, you and Kelly were talking about. And that's to ask, you know, what are some of the common arguments or objections that you hear from stakeholders when they uh, perhaps trying not to bring procurement to the table, have a conversation with procurement? Uh, I have definitely seen stakeholders throw their experience around. Mm-hmm. Um and be, especially because they know you're, there's no way that procurement's going to be as knowledgeable when it comes to particular parts and categories as they are. I mean, these guys are literally like working on machinery every day. Of course, they're going to know it better than you. So that's one w- challenge that uh, a procurement professional is going to be faced with dealing with people that know that they're the experts and know more about the category than you which in reality comes to every, uh, pretty much every category, but um, there's definitely MRO stakeholders that have been doing the same thing for 30 years that are going to give you a hard time. Um, stakeholders also uh, like to use local suppliers because they've built a relationship and a rapport with them, mm-hmm. even though that's probably not the best supplier to use, um, but it, it's, you know, his, the, the guy lives three houses down from him and their kids yeah. are on the same baseball team. So it's those, those can be tricky situations and you just have to learn to, to be able to work with them in order to effectively show why this is what's best for the business overall. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to ask just so that uh, I think being aware of the objections and being prepared for them is you know half the battle that's you know when it comes to um you know a sales professional they're going to be coming into a conversation ready with the objections that you bring and have thought out ways that they can um you know maybe position your thinking differently or give you something else to think about so knowing those going into those first conversations i think is really valuable yep agreed now i think uh, any conversation about mro would be be remiss if I didn't ask you about PPE. Sure. Um, you know, here we are, end of October as we're recording this. Um, what are you currently seeing in terms of PPE uh, for companies actually being able to meet their on demand, you know, get into the building, the PPE that they need to continue to operate? Sure. Um, especially in today's environment and the COVID world that we're all living in. Um, when it comes to PPE, PPE is now like a, a paramount conversation that goes all the way up to the CEO. Um, so who just thought that 12 months I ago? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so buyers are definitely faced with a, a difficult task. Um, I've seen companies purchasing in bulk and, and large quantities in order to you know, make sure that they have every supply available under the sun. Uh, I have seen people on the back end desperately trying to get PPE supplies that are now out of stock because on the other side of the table, the other guy purchased in bulk. Um, It's it's definitely an interesting one. Uh, It did put a lot of burden on the PPE supply chain uh, based on the increase in demand. Um, But Manufacturing has now caught up to mm-hmm. the PPE demand. However, if people continue panic buying in bulk, you'll be faced with the same shortage again. The supply chain is sustainable if people are purchasing in a sustainable fashion, and everyone purchasing in bulk is not sustainable for the supply chain. Uh, uh, and yet, probably likely that that's what people are going to do. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, most likely it's human nature when they think that there's a scarcity, uh, issue arising, they're going to try, they're going to panic buy, they're going to try to purchase, um, as much product as they can in order to make sure that they're meeting their company's needs or over exceeding their company's needs. Mm -hmm. I would guarantee that you're going to be seeing, um, 
you know, coming out of this, there's going to be cases and cases of gloves and respirators just sitting in somebody's inventory because yeah. they overpurchased. Yeah. Uh, that, they, they might never ever consume more. By the time that they would consume them, the half life on them is shot. You know, for for a company that finds themselves in that situation where you know others have been bulk buying, we we perhaps get ourselves over the winter into a situation where PPE becomes scarce again. How important has the value of your supplier relationship or the value of your relationship, should I say, be with your PPE provider? Does Is that out of the window at this point or are those no, companies that have been successful? Not. You yeah. need to make sure now is definitely the time to be making sure that you have a strong relationship with the, your PPE supplier. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it, this is a perfect example of why you should be having strong relationships with your supply base in general and making them feel like they're a partner versus just a tactical supplier. Yeah. Um, this a, a, a supplier that feels like they're a valued partner to your organization is going to be made, actively making recommendations, letting you know when things are about to have a supply chain issue, working with you to find a suitable alternate if there is a supply chain issue, um, doing all sorts of things to, to help guide you through it. Um, to the extent, if you're a top tier customer for them, you treat they feel like they're a partner to your organization. Yeah. They're going to put you at the front of the line. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's honestly, it's very, very important now, especially to, to be treating your PPE suppliers as partners and to be making sure that you have a good PPE supplier in place. Um, especially now there's a lot of. PPE suppliers that are popping up out of nowhere, yeah. whose products I would probably deem questionable at best. Yeah. Ev everybody is a middleman for, for PPE yeah. <laughs> at this point. It's, it's been quite amazing to see how many middlemen emerge with absolutely zero supply chain or procurements or operations or logistics experience whatsoever. Yeah, they don't even understand the category. I saw um, actually recently uh, this a, a company that sells ink and toner mm -hmm. has now expanded into selling PPE. And it's like, guys there's no way that you understand the supply chain. Like no. you are an ink and toner supplier that does not really coincide with PPE products. Yeah. I, I got tons of pitches because back, <laughs> back in March and April, you know, we were trying to help as well um, organizations in their efforts to get uh, their hands on PPE and um, you know, folks with marketing backgrounds, I can't tell you how many marketing agencies suddenly became PPE middlemen or are proclaimed to be you know, the height of the pandemic, which, you know, it, it puts the onus even more on due diligence at a time when due dil when you don't have time for due diligence. And that's, I guess, the danger. Yeah, for sure. Um, there is just one thing I wanted to bring when you said about treating your PPE supplier as a valued partner. What I think is really important lesson from all of this as well is that any supplier, you know, it's kind of a mindset thing. But any supplier you should be looking at as being a valued partner rather than a vendor, you know, a hot dog vendor on the street corner. Because even suppliers in those categories that you may think, well, you know what, that's a commodity. It may be a commoditized product, but that provider can still help you understand how you can more effectively buy um, and what you can do to reduce your consumption or what you can do to replace products or whatever it may be if you look at that as being a partnership where you're thinking strategically. And I do think that's something we miss a lot. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it, sometimes it doesn't even take a lot. Just hold a, a QBR with, yeah. with your supplier. That's once a quarter for an hour and a half. It, it's, you should be able to make that time for, for a supplier to your organization. Well, Mike, I know it's about time for us to wrap up. So I want to ask the, the easy question that I always end in. Um, and if that is, if any listeners listening in, they would like to connect with you, uh, talk more about what's going on in the MRO category, where would be the best place them to find you? Yeah, just uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it, my profile is underneath my name, uh, Mike Crosdale. Uh, well, actually, I think on LinkedIn, it's Michael Crosdale, but <laughs> you, you can reach out to me there and I'll, I'll be sure to follow up. Perfect. Well, what I'll do, Mike, is I will include a link in the show notes for today's episode to um, your LinkedIn profile. So that's going to be at artofprocurement.com slash podcast. 
and uh, you will find as you go there all the latest episodes including this one with mike um so first of all kelly i want to thank you so much for joining us and for asking uh some of the questions to mike today thanks very much this is a great category well done mike and (laughs) and mike yeah thank you very much for joining us yeah thanks for having me